let's take a look at uh, the business, what I call the business end of the chainsaw. <clears throat> this is where the chain is. All chainsaws have two bolts that hold a cover that covers the gear that runs the chain. As the chain gets used, it's spinning along on the bar, it wears the bar. So the bar gets smaller and smaller, and the chain also wears, and it gets bigger and bigger. So pretty soon, <clears throat> we have a situation where <clears throat> the chain is hanging down. So we need to deal with that by pushing the bar out to make up for the wear. Anytime that this is down an eighth of an inch, you should adjust to push the bar out. There are two ways that the bar gets pushed out. <clears throat> this one here has a screw attached to a cog, and that cog fits into a hole on the bar. So when we put this back on, all we have to do is screw this screw clockwise, and that pushes the bar out. If we push it counterclockwise, it pulls the bar in. It's very easy. It's right here on the outside <clears throat> and works uh, wonderfully. The one slight defect that all these saws have is that they are a little loose. So if I pick this bar up, the chain drops a little bit. So when you do the adjustment, you want to hold it up <clears throat> and adjust it and then tighten the nuts. Otherwise, the first time you use it and push down, that will go up and the chain will be loose again. Now the other has the cog on the inside, on this side of the bar. So it's a bit harder to find that and adjust uh, from there, but it works out pretty well. I said there are two, I'm sorry, there are three ways that the adjustments take place. But in this case, it's a screw on this side or it's a screw on this side. As simple as can be. For some reason, some manufacturers have decided, oh, let's make ours different. So <clears throat> this guy here, instead of having the screw here or here, it has it here. So the screw is now perpendicular to the bar. So how is screwing this going to push a bar out? Well, it's going to need a gear. So there's now <clears throat> a helical gear in here, and those always break. And <clears throat> well, again, uh, when things break, it's your fault, right? <laughs> but I th would suggest that this method of pushing the bar out is inferior. I got this saw for 10 bucks. It's like a $1,000 saw because that was broken and the owner uh, didn't know how to fix it or couldn't find a dealer to fix it. <clears throat> but it didn't, didn't take me long to find a used one and uh, I now have a, this extraordinary saw. So if you happen to have one like that, what it means is that <clears throat> you can't be a brute. You can't stick your screwdriver in there and force it <clears throat> to push that bar out. If when you turn the screw, it doesn't freely go out, stop, figure out why. <laughs> Probably the two nuts that you have there are too tight or there's a whole lot of dirt in there or sap or whatever. So it can be made uh, to work. But this original design of a screw this way or that way is far uh, better and will never give you uh, any trouble. So we have a motor. <clears throat> in the same position that this saw is here. And when it's turning, <clears throat> the air is being sucked in here through all of these fins to cool the motor off. It goes through the fins and it also goes past the muffler to cool the muffler off. What else is being sucked in when this is running? Well, this is running right here and right here is this chain throwing up sawdust. And the chain also has a lot of oil on it. All chainsaws have a tank full of oil, and oil is constantly dribbling on the chain to keep it from uh, wearing out too fast. So that mixture of oil and sawdust makes concrete, basically, that gets stuck in these fins. When that happens, they don't get cooled, and the engine freezes up. So I have here several engines that show <coughs> the pistons uh, totally scored, and the uh, rings on the pistons basically welded to the pistons and that's because it was not cooling or because there wasn't enough oil in the gas and uh, this should never happen but it happens routinely and the only way to fix it is to buy a head and a piston 
And for a saw this size, it would probably cost about $100. The saw itself, this size, would be about eight, $900. So it's worth buying a piston and head and rebuilding it. And it might take you an hour and a half, two hours at most, to replace these uh, components. Now over here, on this side, we have the clutch. This is a, a typical clutch. <clears throat> it has a gear that drives the chain called a sprocket, and it has a clutch. Now the clutch is right here. You see this S-shaped thing here? When the engine is idling, it just stays the way it is. But when the engine is revved up, these two lobes spread apart and grab this. So it's a centrifugal clutch. It works simply on speed. So when it's idling, <clears throat> there's not enough centrifugal uh, force to spread those, and the chain doesn't move. The minute you pull the trigger, they spread apart, and <clears throat> this thing gets caught and gets uh, moved. So picture what happens when somebody gets the chain stuck in a tree and the engine is still roaring. This thing here is spinning inside of this thing and in a sh very short time melts it. And then the clutch just breaks, <clears throat> just blows up, <laughs> and you've lost uh, both the clutch and the sprocket. So that's avoided by always running the saw full tilt all the way so that you get enough power to have the chain move and, of course, an extremely sharp chain. The minute chain gets dull, it starts to catch in the wood and then slippage happens in that clutch and <clears throat> uh, you ruin it. It uh, never pays to use a uh, dull saw. All right, a couple words about the bars. There are three types of bars. The bar that comes on cheap saws is basically three pieces of steel. So there are <clears throat> one on each side and then a smaller one in the middle. And these are basically tacked together, spot welded, and they're really poor. Because water gets in between the three layers, it uh, rusts. So if you ha run your hand along this one, it's just all lumpy and bumpy because the rust in there is growing like mad, uh, blowing this thing apart. A good bar is one solid piece of steel with a groove cut into it. The uh, cheaper saws will always have, surprisingly, a little wheel on the end. And that little wheel has teeth on it, uh, gears that will lift the chain off of the tip so that the tip doesn't wear. That gives it a little more horsepower. So it makes it stronger than it otherwise would be. The trouble, though, is that if you put a wheel in here, this tip is no longer very strong. And for most people, apparently, that doesn't matter. But for a real sawyer, that's terrible. Because when I dropped a tree, <clears throat> I would just climb up on the tree. And then I'd be going like this <clears throat> all the way down the tree, cutting all the limbs off, using the tip for that. So the tip is hitting everything. It's getting knocked around and uh, subject to a lot of abuse. So <clears throat> the tips break. And now the whole bar is no good. So they came out with a bar with replaceable tips. So you can just buy these tips here. <clears throat> when they break, just put a new tip on. A truly professional bar, however, <clears throat> is more like this one here. The chain comes off very easily. <clears throat> bar comes off. And if you look closely at this bar, you'll see that right around the tip here, there is a different kind of steel. And this is called a GW bar, which stands for gas weld. So an extraordinarily hard mixture of metals is on the tip here so that it does not wear off. Of course, it does <clears throat> eventually. And when that happens, you simply mail it back to the company and they'll melt another whole new tip on it. So the advantage to this is that you, longevity. This bar will last through hundreds of hours worth of uh, sawing. And of course, it's quite a bit more expensive. Now, what happens to bars? <clears throat> we have on every chainsaw a tank that uh, houses oil. And in the old days, we just used <clears throat> 30 or 40 weight oil in there. A lot of people just used, uh, used uh, motor oil, that kind of thing. Uh, but what works better <clears throat> is an oil that's made specifically to be sticky. And today that's called bar oil. And uh, <clears throat> it is certainly worth going to the bar oil. It uses much less of it. And it doesn't uh, 
pollute as much, I suppose, but frankly, the amount of water that gets thrown off from a chainsaw is uh, less than bacteria in the ground will gobble up in no time at all. <laughs> what would really hurt your environment is draining your tractor oil right there on the ground. That would be a, <clears throat> a real crime. The, uh, <clears throat> again, here, sawdust gets in there, so every once in a while you want to empty the oil and put uh, raw gasoline in there, shake it all up, and get all that dirt back out of there <clears throat> so that the oil will come through. To make sure that you are getting oil, when you start the saw, aim it, aim the tip on something relatively clean, pull the trigger once, and you should see some oil spit <clears throat> on that piece of wood. If no oil is spit on the piece of wood, stop right there, because the lack of oil will immediately ruin the bar. It takes very little oillessness to do that. So the bar has a hole <clears throat> that lines up with a slot in the chainsaw. Oil is uh, pumped there by another rubber diaphragm that's in the tank and that oil goes through this little hole here into the rail <clears throat> of the bar. And of course this chain is going around like mad with all that sawdust and it sucks sawdust up into here and it clogs that hole. So if you're not getting oil it's probably because this hole is plugged and it gets packed really tight. It takes a, a, a nail that sometimes you have to hit to get that sawdust uh, out of there. So as you're running out of oil, what happens is that less and less oil gets onto the bar and the near side of the bar gets oil for a time before there's no oil, but the far side doesn't. So one side of the bar <clears throat> wears more than the other side. So now your chain is going to be cocked. So when you're going through the wood, the chainsaw starts to turn. And because the chainsaw is flat, it can't turn. So it only turns a little bit and then it's stuck. That is an extremely annoying thing to happen. So people bring their chainsaws to the dealer and, they, and ex explain what has happened. And they say, oh yeah, you ruined your chain, you, you ruined your bar, you gotta buy a new chain and a new bar. <laughs> and of course, that's totally untrue. All you need to do is take your bar <clears throat> to a grindstone. You're going to put on here a square. You drop the square and you can see very clearly that it's touching one side and not the other. So you just give it one pass <whistles> on your grinder. <clears throat> Check it. Might need a second pass. <whistles> and now you're all set. Your bar is like new. It can always be uh, repaired. The other thing that uh, sometimes happens is if, if you're running it without uh, oil, the bar will mushroom. So on both sides here you get this little bit of mushroom of, uh, of steel. And <clears throat> that is annoying because when you're sawing that mushroom catches on the wood so you're not having to uncatch it to get it to go. And that too, you just give it a pass on a grindstone <clears throat> and grind that right off. Uh, bars are very uh, uh, repairable that way. Hey there, thank you for watching. Here at Shelter Institute in Woolwich, Maine, we teach a wide variety of house building and timber framing and carving classes. We'd love to see you here, but if you can't make it to Maine to take one of our classes, our online class is available at shelterinstitute.com.